Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to LG Equipment's Q1 FY22 Earnings Conference Call hosted by Asian Market Securities Limited. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company which are based on the belief and expectation of the company as on the, as on the date of this call. These statements are not a guarantee of future performance and involve risk and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. Actual results may differ from such expectation, projection, etc. Whether expressed or implied, participants are requested to exercise caution while referring to such statements and remarks. As a reminder, all participants' line will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star, then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Kamlesh Kota from Asian Market Securities. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thanks, Bilal. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Asian Markets, we welcome you all to the 1QFI22 Earnings Conference Call of LG Equipments Limited. We have with us today Mr. Jairam Vanadaj, Managing Director, representing the company. I request Mr. Jairam to take us through the overview of the quarterly results, and then we shall begin the Q&A session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kamlesh. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, to be with us this evening. Uh, I hope I can make this interesting for you. Um, you know, this is a very, uh, very funny quarter because uh, the reference quarter of the prior year was is an irrelevant quarter because for almost two months of that quarter, uh, there was no business. So if, we, if I do a comparative analysis of the two, we will look like we are doing exceedingly well. Uh, and that wouldn't press... Uh, present the right picture about the current performance status of the company. So uh, I, I don't want to, one option was to look at the second quarter of last year as a basis to compare our performance uh, with the first quarter of this year, considering that there was a lag. But that also was a little unrealistic because in the second quarter of last year, the mix of sales uh, was very different from a steady state because there was more of global sales and less of India sales. And as a consequence, the, the profitability ratios were uh, quite skewed uh, in the second quarter. So we did multiple things. Uh, so instead of the traditional reconciliation that I do, I will talk about this quarter's performance in relation to the first quarter of 1920, which was a steady state year before COVID happened. So when you compare it with the Q1 of 1920, we have grown our uh, revenue by almost uh, six, seven percent. And uh, uh, the, however, at a contribution level, we were lower by one percent. And at an EBITDA level, we were lower by 2%, right? So this is, this is how the numbers stack up. Uh, if I have to look at the contribution analysis, why did we lose uh, a percentage uh, from a steady state here? The primary reason has been the increase in the raw material cost, which really started in October of last year and kept marching up and quite uh, violently kept marching up till uh, February. We did a series of price corrections during this period in the market, both in India and internationally. It seemed to pause a bit in February, uh, but uh, by the end of March and beginning of April, it had a violent upward movement again, and that caught us uh, by surprise. And again, we went into another price correction. And for us in uh, capital goods, there is always a lag between a price announcement, a price revision in the market, and the 
realization of the revision in the P&L. So we have, in this quarter, we have gone through that uncomfortable period of the lag. Uh, we have done multiple. In fact, we have done five price corrections in the market. It's been very challenging and difficult to do that. Uh, but we went ahead and did it because it had to be done. In some of it, we have recovered. Some of it, we have had to absorb. So that's the real reason why we have lost out on contribution in the first quarter compared to the, um, to the uh, same quarter in 1920. So what do we expect? Uh, I think this is a more interesting question. Uh, what do we expect uh, that this year will be? Um, so let me talk a little bit about the second quarter. In the second quarter, we expect roughly the same phenomenon to continue because price corrections are, being ha are happening. The last one what we did was in June. So that will take a lag. So I don't expect a big change in the, in the margin uh, contribution. I don't see it dropping, but I don't see it significantly going back to recover the uh, raw material crisis. Uh, price increases. But in the third and fourth quarter, combined we should come back to normal. And I expect that the full year the, for 21-22, I expect that the, uh, the material cost percentage would be almost the same as 21-22. So we'll get it back to that level. In fact, if you look at uh, the first quarter's material cost percentage is 53.7%, and for the full year last year was 534 So with all these changes that we are doing, I'm very confident that we will get closer to that, uh, that 534 number that we had for the full year of last year. Now, over and above these uh, price recoveries that are, that are happening, we, have, we are in the middle of final stages of the uh, rolling out a very, very comprehensive cost reduction program at the material cost and variable cost level. Our targeted reduction is 2% on our uh, revenue. So that the project that is going to happen is going to take uh, uh, is over a 10 month period. So part of that 2%, we will also realize during the current financial year. So that's why I'm very confident that by the end of this financial year, at the worst case, our material cost percentage will be the same as uh, the previous uh, financial year. So having said that, what about the top line? Now, if you look at the top line compared to, again, Q1 of uh, uh, 1920, we have grown about 6%. This 6% is a, is a, doesn't reflect the actual situation of the company and the market. Uh, we could have grown another 7 to 8%. We had the orders, we have uh, the, the thing, but we just had supply challenges. So, which we have overcome in quite significantly in June and July. So therefore, I'm very confident the second quarter and the quarters to follow, the growth in revenue is going to be a lot more compared to 1920. And I expect the, at, when we close the year, our growth, our top line growth at the worst case will be at the uh, low to mid-teens, mid <coughs> excuse me, low to mid-teens at the minimum. So my expectation is even if there is a, a few Percent, points of a fractions of a percentage uh, challenge on material cost, we will more than recover on our <coughs> leverage. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> on, on the top line is going to be a very positive number. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit more background to that uh, confidence, uh, India has been. Uh, rec has recovered very well. Uh, unlike the first wave, the second wave had uh, dislocations in regions, first in Delhi, Maharashtra, then it came to the south. And, uh, and by the time the south got really uh, uh, intense, 
Delhi and Maharashtra kind of eased up and business started happening. But everywhere, the underlying uh, desire for business and a positive sentiment remained throughout the, uh, the second wave. There was, it was always there. It was the inability to deliver, which was the constraint and not the demand itself or the buoyancy in the market. So uh, for us in, uh, in Coimbatore, our plant was running without any stop. We had, we had no issues. We, the team man, did an excellent job of managing infections of our people. Very few, uh, very low incidence of infection internally and uh, very little uh, serious uh, repercussions of infections in our company. So it was done, handled very well. But our biggest challenge was our local suppliers. Their factories had to be shut uh, for extended periods because uh, their employees got uh, infected, pretty large percentage got infected. So that really challenged our ability to supply. And that's why I'm saying that we could have done a lot higher in top line. Uh, compared to uh, what we actually did. So that, that buoyancy and optimism goes into the, into the second quarter and onward. Now, from the market side, like I said, India, there is still a very positive sentiment. Uh, Europe, is, is the, the revenue is tracking higher than what we had budgeted as part of our strategic plan to invest. So it's a very positive thing. The U.S. is coming back from uh, a, a very low economic activity, but even in that low economic activity, we continue to grow in the U.S., which was very positive. With the additional stimulus and the infrastructure spend, we look forward to a very positive um, uh, response from the market for our products in the U.S. So it's very positive there. The biggest challenge for us is really uh, Osea, which is o Oceania and Southeast Asia. Uh, Australia has going through serious lockdowns of cities in pockets, Sydney, Melbourne, now Brisbane. And Southeast Asia, uh, key markets like Indonesia and Thailand uh, and Malaysia are facing some serious uh, infection-related lockdowns. So we'll have to wait and see how these markets... So the first quarter performance of... Uh, uh, Oceania, Australia was good, but towards the end of the first quarter, they went into lockdown. But uh, the rest of Southeast Asia was uh, quite challenging throughout the first quarter. But I believe that they will they will come back. So we are very confident that with all this, uh, the top line strength is going to be quite strong for the balance of the quarters. Now, in terms of preventing uh, the same inability. Uh, I believe that uh, the third wave is not a question of if, it's a question of when. Uh, and when it does happen, how do we ensure that the supply inabilities that we inherited or experienced in the second wave, we don't uh, replicate it in the third wave. Now, we have done aggressive uh, vaccination programs within the company. Now, 91% of our people on working who have to come to work have been vaccinated. Uh, the first shot, and 40% have been vaccinated on the second shot. Uh, and we are taking this vaccination program to our contract employees as well as the employees of our suppliers. So we are putting a, 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 a lot of diligence into it, and hopefully in the next few weeks, we will start to see uh, percentages uh, increasing in all these segments of people who, are, uh, who have a strong bearing on our supply capability. Uh, the third major cost uh, is employee cost. Now, uh, last year is not a comparison because there were a lot of subsidies from the US and Australia specifically, which kind of distorted uh, our employee cost. So if you add those subsidies back as a steady state cost and remove uh, the money that we spent on our VRS that we launched in March, the Increase in our uh, overall cost uh, that we expect for this year. So if we go back and say, what will be the expected cost, manpower cost uh, end of March 
of 21-22, it will be about between 9 to 10 percent growth over the corrected number, the corrected number for uh, um, 2020-21. The corrected number, the published number is 4,117 million, of which there was a subsidy of 242 million and uh, VRS of 37 million. So if you net all add the subsidy back and deduct the uh, VRS amount, it's coming to 4,322. And we expect the annualized cost this year, including headcount increases, is 4,746. Now, many of these headcount increases are a function of timing and uh, traction in the business that we need to. So this will be the worst case, will be about 9 to 10%. The actual salary increase that we have done is uh, hovering between 6 to 7% for this year, which has been a very reasonable uh, percentage compared to what's happening. But there is, you know, with the IT industry uh, announcing the kind of percentages and bonuses, this is a bit worrisome in terms of our attrition of talent, but this is what we can afford and we need to manage around it. So if I take all these factors into account, I think we have a, a reasonably optimistic year uh, to look ahead to. Uh, sales will be a good growth. Um, contribution at, at worst case will remain at the same uh, level as uh, the whole of last year. Manpower cost would go up maximum between 9 to 10%. The other fixed cost will be a function of how we do uh, our growth and the top line. If it's not there, it's not going to be there. If it is there, it will moderate itself. So at the end of the day, our EBITDA under normalized conditions would be a lit, as a percentage level a little higher than what it was uh, uh, last year, percentage-wise. Uh, last year on a much higher uh, top line. So this is really the um, summary of our uh, business on Q1 and what we expect for the balance of the year. So I will stop here and uh, I will rely on your questions to clarify more. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone? who wishes to ask any question, may press star and one on your touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may please press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. To ask a question, you may please press star and one. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have a first question from the line of Ravi Swaminathan from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, Ravi. My, How are you? Yeah. Great, sir. How are you, sir? Uh, sir, my well, first you. question. Uh, sir, my first question is with respect to the domestic market. Uh, if you can give more uh, clarity, uh, granular details on how the demand is there from infra side, industrial side. Uh, SME side, uh, how it is compared to say last year or last to last year, uh, it will be really great, sir. Okay, so um, in the first quarter, there was one segment which was kind of disproportionately uh, significant. I wouldn't say that was a large uh, proportion of our sales. I don't want to give the specific numbers, which this was uh, compressors required for oxygen generators. Now, we were approached by DRDO, uh, who had licensed the production of these uh, oxygen generators to um, LNT as well as Tata Advanced Material, uh, Materials Limited. And we were to give a large number of compressors in the months of uh, April, May, and June. Uh, and that continues and continued into July as well. And we focused on, uh, we prioritized this supply. As a consequence, uh, we could not supply to certain other segments, but 
it was very gratifying to see uh, most of our customers were understanding of the reason. So they did not cancel orders. They stayed with us and took a deferred delivery. Now, so if I take the oxygen piece out and talk about the market, the buoyancy and inquiry and orders were very solid across all segments. And in industrial, we saw activity across all industry verticals. There was not even automotive, which was challenged. The automotive component suppliers were looking at buying uh, uh, compressors to increase their capacity. So it was, I can't say that there was one segment that stood out, not at all, right? The first way we were thinking it will be food and textiles, I mean, sorry, food and uh, uh, chemicals and, and pharmaceuticals, but Unlike that, this was across all. So even construction and mining, water well, uh, water well, the regular business has not come back, but there was the OE customer segment was very strong for supply of complete packages to African countries. And we have a very good share in that market this year. The, we are hoping that this market opens up this year. And I'm very glad to say that the new product that we have launched and we have been testing for the last one and a half years has gone very solid traction in the market. So when the market opens up, we are ready to regain our position in that market. This time, very, very confident. So the, all across, uh, it was there. There was a pause in the month of uh, May and June on our aftermarket, right? Because plants are not running, nobody is going to buy spare parts. So that's one, one more reason why you see there was a, a challenge on our contribution. And that's come back now strongly. Right? So I, I can't say there is any one industry. It was across the board. Got it, sir. And uh, would the inquiry levels, were, is it safe to say it would have grown by kind of a double-digit number in terms of volumes, etc.? Uh, sales, uh, sales would have grown double-digit. Compared to compared to uh, uh, FY uh, nine, nine, FY twenty first quarter, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now okay. we and we have uh, grown we have grown only five or six percent, but we would have de definitely done double digit growth. It's not for the constraints that we have. Got it, sir. And with respect to price increase, what could have been the approximate magnitude of price increase that you would have taken? And is there any other price increase which might be there on cards to compensate for well, the last? Like I said, the last price increase was done in uh, June. Combined <laughs> price increase, I'm talking on average, is about 15%. 15%. And uh, over, uh, over, over five installments, four to five installments. And is there any resistance from customers uh, given the fact that 15% price increase is on the steeper side? Obviously, there is resistance. It's also a function of a lot of competitors delaying that. So uh, 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 customers point to that. But the reality is everybody knows in the, every business, right? In every commodity, there has been an increase in price, right? So this is not something that is LG's inefficiency, right? Uh, it is a it is a reality that it's hitting everyone. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Got it, sir. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone who wishes to ask any question, may please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Bhavan Ritlani from SBI Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, Jay, good performance, uh, Amit. Sorry, and and uh, good performance amidst the challenges. Thanks, so, Robert. Questions. Uh, a few questions here. Uh, uh, on the, the newer uh, products that we would have launched, so one on uh, what were you did outline, but if you could also highlight about uh, the, the oil field compressors, how has that been tracking? Because that is one area that you were expecting to change a group of it. So, um, our oil free machine that we we have two uh, category of products the conventional two stage dry screw and then 
are water injected ABCD. Now, both of them have grown exceedingly well in the first quarter, right? Uh, not only in relation to the prior years, but also in relation to the fourth quarter of last year, which was itself a good year. So, and it is not just in India, but globally, right? So this has been a very positive thing. Now on our AB series, we have now expanded uh, in another few months, we will be introducing those products. We, we've expanded the range now from a 11 kilowatt up to about 110 kilowatt, we will have oil-free machines in using that technology. So it's a very positive thing that we are then sitting on. And the growth has been good. I don't want to give specific numbers, Bhavan, because I don't want that ex very sensitive for comp uh, from a competitive, competitive point of view. We, we don't appreciate that. For some reason, you're breaking up. I don't know why, but uh, your your voice is coming out cracky. Oh, is it better now? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, the second question is uh, you did highlight that total price actions of about 15% over the last year or so. Uh, is, would it be possible to share? So uh, maybe in some of the key categories, uh, what would be our uh, premium or discount to the market leader, uh, maybe in a cash or an interest or because uh, market feedback always used to be right. So the price, was it a price increase? So the price increases that we have done, uh, I, I think uh, on average are higher than what the uh, competitors have done. Uh, at least that's what the information is. But I have a feeling it's not a question of, you know, competitors not increasing. It is a question of timing. You know, when you're sitting, it all depends on company, uh, which company is sitting on what inventory at what cost, right? So the minute they use up old costs and the uh, price increases are time. So it is only a matter of time because it's not something that is unique to LG. I mean, you look at cold roll steel or hot roll steel, uh, you you look at uh, scrap, everything has just gone through copper, aluminum, all gone through the roof. So, uh, in terms to answer your question, in India, are we at a price premium? We are not at a premium. Are we at a deep discount? No, not at all. Uh, in Europe and the US, are we at a discount? Yes, we are. Is it deep? No. So. Yeah, sure. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, the uh, the second uh, part is if you could give us an update on uh, the motors uh, facility in the previous one, you mentioned there were certain challenges, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, lack of material to uh, restart. I mean, yeah. to start the factories. Yeah. So the challenge was not lack of material. It was a machine that we had ordered with a German supplier, and it got stuck uh, in COVID, and then. They had some technical issues, which continues to uh, keep hampering us. Even now, as we speak, that machine has not come. But uh, the team has parallelly developed an alternate method of uh, producing the, the motors. So today we are producing close to uh, close to 40 to 50 percent of India requirement is now going coming from our motor plant. Right now. We are still hoping that we will get this machine in. Once it comes in, we'll be able to increase that percentage quite significantly. Now, it's not a question of raw material. It's just this machine, which just the alternative is to do it manually, which is a bit laborious, and it takes time, and therefore the output is not as high as we would like it to be. Nevertheless, alternate arrangements have been made by which we are making close to 40 to 50% of the Indian market's total motor required. Sure. Just last question from my side. Uh, over the last year or so, we have seen considerable increase uh, in the logistics cost, especially the sea freight challenges on the availability yeah. front, yeah. Uh, which could be shorter term. But on a more structural front, uh, the policy of most of the Western countries are getting more internalized uh, and uh, for us we have a large 
location in India. Uh, so do you believe, maybe not in the near term, but in the longer run, uh, maybe having some assembly operations closer to the customer given the, the changes we are seeing on the geopolitical fronts? Uh, the the decision to assemble closer to the customer or manufacture closer to the customer will be a function of our with a value proposition to the customer. Not it is it will not get dictated by the current uh, short term shipping challenges. Right now, I say that I say that because. It doesn't matter where you are in a globally interconnected trade trading world. Uh, you're going to, whether you assemble in Europe or India or America, you'll still have shipping. Now you have shipping of machines. Tomorrow it will be shipping of parts, right? So you'll still have those issues. So that's not a relevant factor in that decision. But you're right. We need to, there is a geopolitical dimension. Everybody, every country is exhibiting very protective behavior right so we need to uh, that needs to get factored in but the more important thing is from a customer's point of view and the third dimension is we need to you know we are not a company that is producing compressors at european or american labor cost we are producing compressors at indian labor cost and that that is a, a that is a large a contributor to why our cost structures are low. Now we are working on a program, which I've talked about uh, 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 multiple times in the past, where we are able to make compressors at the, at the, by paying salaries that are European or American and still be profitable at the current level. Now that is a project that is, that is continuing to be worked on. Now till such time, and we think that it's going to take us maybe three to four years to get to that point. Now, we are talking about close to a multiple of four times the blue-collar employee at the current level. Not that we are going to pay, but that's the cost that we need to be uh, able to absorb and still be profitable. Now, it's going to take us about three to four years. Once we are ready there, then we can look at it. Otherwise, we start by assembling now the cost is going to make you uncompetitive. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking my questions. Thank you very much. A reminder to the participant to ask the question, you may please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Ritwik from one of financial. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, though. Uh, so a few questions. Firstly, on uh, clarification, you mentioned in your opening remarks that we are looking at mid-teen top line growth in FI22. So is that over FI21 base or FI20 base? Sorry, uh, can you re can you rephrase that question, please? Yeah. Can you uh, or repeat you that question? Yeah, you mentioned that uh, we are looking to do mid-teen top line growth in FI22. So is that over FI21 base or FI20 base? FI21. FI21. Okay. Sure. And uh, so, uh, is it is it fair to assume that the current employee cost around 118 crores on the consolidated level will continue for the rest of the uh, three quarters as well? Uh, so, so this is the point. This is the point I. So this is what I explained to you. Last year's employee cost was about 412 crores, right? Sure. And out of that 412 crores, we had CD of 24 crores, right? Sure. This is, that's, that is one time uh, the, the job keeper subsidy and the payroll protection program in the U.S. and Australia. That's not going, that is not there now, right? Mm. So yeah. our, our payroll cost, our employee cost was lower to the extent of that, which is not uh, an increase, that is just a subsidy. So if you add that back and then reduce the money that we have spent, about 3.7 crores on VRS, which is not going to repeat, the adjusted FY21 employee cost is 432 crores, right? Right. So against that, our expected employee cost for the year, this current year is 475 crores. 
So that represents a growth of around nine to ten percent. Sure, sure. Uh, that clarification is helpful. Uh, yeah. So my next question is on uh, the split between India and rest of the world. How was it in uh, Q1 FI uh, 22? Sorry, say it again, please. I, I missed you there. Yeah. Uh, revenue split between India and rest of the world for the quarter. In in terms of sales? Yeah, in terms of sales. Yeah, yeah. So roughly the sales today, the current run rate is 50-50. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so in your opening remarks, you mentioned about cost-saving initiatives, uh, yeah. about 200 basis points on the top line. So, what yeah. are these programs? Uh, you know, can you can you elaborate on that? So basically, we are focusing on, like I said, variable cost, which is, uh, you know, if you look at our variable variable cost structure, ninety percent is uh, material cost, right? And the other ten percent of our total variable cost is other variable cost, like electricity and 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 uh, small consumables, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the plan is to take cost out by uh, maybe alternate material, reduction of weight, or uh, changing design, uh, renegotiation with vendors, new vendors. So it's a, it's a combination of using both technical levers to reduce cost and commercial levers to reduce cost, right? So it's a very structured program and uh, we are creating a, we are pulling very talented people within our company to head it on a full-time basis. So I'm very confident that we will achieve it. Okay. Okay. So, so, uh, you know, taking a medium term view, you know, a couple of quarters back, uh, you had mentioned that uh, gross margins uh, can be in the range of 47 to 48%. So would it be fair to assume that, you know, once this raw material cost stabilizes, then uh, and uh, the cost saving initiatives that we are taking, uh, would it be fair to assume that, uh, you know, what, uh, say two years, uh, we can do gross margins in the range of, range of 49 to 50% once we realize these cost saving initiatives that we are doing? So you're talking at a level of material cost of 50%? Yeah, yeah. Right. Material cost hitting 50% is going to be a function of <coughs> better pricing, one. Uh, as well as lower cost. Now, if you look at the two percent that we are going, we are planned to get, which are very confident, and if you if you bake that into a 2021 number, it's going to be already 51.4, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we change our mix uh, to start selling more of oil-free machines, more of aftermarket, because the more you install machines, the more your aftermarket is going to grow. It is that hitting that 50% is not an unrealistic target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. in our, in our strategic plan that we had announced to all the analysts and investors, where we are talking about hitting an EBITDA of 16% uh, mm -hmm. in 23, 24 is mm -hmm. without taking these into account. Yeah. Right. So that's a purely leveraged, leverage-driven growth in EBITDA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is going to be an added factor. So those are, and I, I had mentioned that even when I made that announcement, that these are things that we have not taken into account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are looking to do this in 10 to 12 months' time, right? Yes. Okay. Sure. So, and my last question is related to Europe. Uh, you know, we are seeing, uh, we, we are uh, investing in uh, to increase our uh, geographic uh, footprint there and, uh, you know, investing in personnel as well. So, uh, you know, when, when do you think that uh, this will fructify in terms of top line, uh, top line? So the top line, like I said, uh, we, we have made a five-year plan and we said at the end of the fifth year, we are going to uh, uh, break even and then start becoming positive. Now, uh, we, as far as the top line is concerned and the extent of loss, we are better on top line and lower on the loss that we had planned. So we, Europe is going really on the right track, right? In the right, 
direction in that we wanted to go as far as this project is concerned. So the final number for Europe is actually the 2425. Sure. Sure. Okay, so that's it from my side. All the best and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ranjit Shivaram from ICICI Security. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, sir. Good evening. Uh, hi, Ranjit. Uh, yeah. Uh, one thing which uh, we noticed is that there has been a 2 to 3 crore EBITDA loss in the subsidies. When we uh, that, uh, Ranjit, Ranjit can, you, can you please uh, speak up or something is wrong? I, I'm not you're sounding a little garbled. Uh, is it audible now? Yes. Yeah, so when we when we do that subtraction of the EBITDA of the consult to stand loan, it shows that around 2 to 3 crores of uh, loss from the subsidiaries are there in the EBITDA level. Yeah. So it, which of these geographies were the major in, uh, majorly impacted in terms of uh, these uh, losses and how do you see this? Yeah, we know that zero is still in the in investment mode, but uh, is there something that can throw a surprise in the next quarters where we can turn on some of these activities? So the loss, the the Europe is the most significant loss, right? Uh, and the only loss. There is a marginal loss in Gulf, which is only a transient thing, nothing to be worried about. Uh, there is no, I don't see it as a surprise that is going to come. It's a very small operation. Um, so Europe is the only region that is making a loss, and that was very deliberately planned. And like I said, the planned loss is actually, I mean, the actual loss is lower than the planned loss. So we are, we are tracking to a good trajectory there. Okay, and what's the uh, outlook from the, uh, the, uh, the three major markets, like Australia is one major market for us, then the uh, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and uh, and uh, North America. So how, are the, uh, how do you look at in terms of growth from this market, if you can give some more color in terms of each market-wise, and what's the current scenario out there? And in North America, we are hearing regarding huge spending for infrastructure from the uh, United States. So yeah. will we be the beneficiary of that, if you can throw some light on that. Okay, so Australia, I'm going to give you, I'm going to respond on a non-COVID uh, situation. So Australia uh, on a non-COVID is in a very strong wicket. Um, has a lot of opportunities that are there, that, uh, that uh, there's a lot of investment going on in mining as well. Uh, <coughs> so on a non-COVID condition, it's a very solid uh, situation. The same thing with Southeast Asia. Uh, it's one of the largest markets um, outside of India and Australia in that region. So, uh, they, they, and we are well placed now. We have built a team. We are very strongly placed with a good team in Malaysia, in, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and Philippines. And therefore, uh, once... The, these countries come out of the, the current situation, there will be, uh, uh, we expect it to be very positive there. Uh, Gulf is, like I said, it's a small market and uh, we, are, we are growing. Uh, US, uh, yes, there is a huge uh, stimulus investment package that the government has rolled out. Uh, definitely there will be uh, the trickle down demand for our products because we, both our portables as well as our industrials will are linked in some way to the infrastructure plans of that country. Uh, some more directly like portables, some kind of indirectly as the capacity to supply to the, to the uh, infrastructure requirements, uh, the industrials will also grow. So we are quite optimistic there. Okay, and we have the whole portfolio uh, most of our portfolio is already there in US, or is there any gap? 
we have to work um, in if you look at oil lubricated and oil free we pretty much have the full portfolio uh there may be you know company has got it 100% there they are at 90 odd percent so few percentages but that's an ongoing process of development okay i'm sir uh, till now in the domestic the screw compressor market one of our uh, domestic competitors the most can united seems to be there in the piston compressors now we are hearing that they want to enter into the screw compressor market in a very aggressive way with their own localized manufacturing facility so can you how prepared are we for that because one more domestic competition uh, can that stop the current market share so what is your overall thought on this well kirloskar has not been uh, a stranger to screw compressors <clears throat> they've been making <clears throat> screw compressors excuse me just give me a minute <clears throat> they've been making screw compressors for a long time so this is not anything new uh they have technology and they are trying to build machines and if we look at our order loss we are not losing orders to them and so well if it's it's a free world and if they're going to build machines and they make good machines and we it's, a, it's good competition so we'll compete with them so we are quite confident of competing if we can compete with atlas cup codes and the ingersoll rands of the world i think we can compete with kirloskar also okay so you don't see any major disruption in our market share no i don't see it because it has been going on no you you at the bottom you have a lot of these companies that are importing complete machines from china and selling them uh, we okay we lose a little bit but it's not like we have they have taken dominated and taken over the market right okay Mark, market is growing everyone's participating so it's not like there's going to be a disruption in the industrial structure yeah okay and this uh, price hikes which you have taken we believe that in the next two to three quarters we have we will see that impact in the in the market yeah. 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 yeah 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 okay sir so all the best uh, for the next thank you quarters. thank you ranjit thank you the next question is from the line of vipul shah from sumangal investment please go ahead hi sir thanks for the opportunity uh, sir so what um, what type of ebitda losses we should expect annually from european operations over next 2 to 3 years uh i don't have the numbers in front of me uh, vipul so uh we we had plan what we had announced earlier was that we are going to invest through in the form of losses of about 190 crores over a period of 5 years right so uh, and we are tracking to something lower than that so that that's the overall number okay sir and secondly once this uh, machine which is held up due to covid once it is delivered uh, uh, what percentage of motor production will be in house which is now roughly 50% as you say so that number is not going to significantly increase it's only going to in- increase our productivity and our cost because like i said we made alternate arrangements not to uh, uh, not as a compromise to the volume we have targeted a certain volume without this machine we had to do it so the machine comes maybe from 50% it will go up to 60 or maybe 65 but the entire production will become a lot more efficient right okay and that delivery will depend on the trajectory of covid on the right sir yeah. well covid is one and we are also having the custom the supplier is having some technical issues we have to get that sorted out quickly yeah okay sir all the best and thank you thank you Thank you. A reminder to the participant to ask a question. You may please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Dikshit Mittal from LIC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Just wanted a little bit more color on the growth guidance that you're giving around detail. Uh, uh, because you have also said that uh, you have taken around 15% price hike. So that means the uh, whole growth will be driven by the realization gain only, or will there be volume growth as well? Uh, there will be growth beyond. I mean, the price hike is not only uh, growth that has happened in uh, Q1. Yeah. Okay. So there will be growth beyond that that uh, price hike. Okay. And sir, like uh, when you uh, guide for the like growth margin, so uh, because the commodity prices are on an uptrend, so you'll be uh, uh, like making a, a growth margin in a percentage terms or maybe you're, you're targeting a six, uh, maybe per compressor kind of growth margin in your pricing. No, I didn't understand your question. Uh, sir, because uh, uh, when you target a particular growth margin, you target on a per compressor basis absolute margin or maybe on a percentage basis because when the commodities are rising, so that means your gross profit may rise in tandem with commodity, right? Uh, on a per no, we, don't, we, don't, we li don't like to keep the profit constant. We would like to keep the profit as a percentage of our variable cost. That's how we have done up our costing model, right? Uh, otherwise, what happens is then you need to, if I do it as a fixed cost, then your uh, EBITDA percentages start dropping, right? Correct. Right. So, uh, no, we don't do our costing that way. We do it as a percentage contribution. Oh, thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Anyone who wishes to ask any question, <clears throat> may please press star N1 now. We have a follow-on question from the line of Babin Vatani from SBI Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity again. Uh, so the question is on the U.S., uh, wherein we had uh, two acquisitions. So if you could give us uh, uh, the update of uh, both these subsidiaries. And then we had also uh, targeted to uh, do joint ventures with uh, local people to increase our distribution. Uh, so over the last one year, uh, if you could give us a progress, that would be useful. So uh, we had the acquisition that you're talking about is the first one was 2000 and uh, I guess 2012 December. That's okay. that's uh, that's uh, patent. So are you asking about the performance of patent? Uh, yes, patents and the, the second one which we had announced. Second one was two years ago, which was Michigan Air, right? Now, Mich Michigan Air is growing, patents is also growing, but like you like you know that in patents there was a competitive action that dislocated our business and our turnover dropped. And now we are picking it back up and we are climbing it progressively back to uh, the levels it was earlier, right? Uh, so it is it is on the right trajectory. Yeah. Uh, so Michigan Air is also doing well, and it is on the right trajectory. As far as the joint ventures are concerned, we have uh, joint ventures in five locations, and all of them are growing, uh, and they are hit. They are they are tending towards profitability a lot earlier than. So this, these, these are good regions that we have chosen in terms of potential and we have partnered with the right people who have the the market and domain knowledge so it's been a very positive experience uh, just a follow-up here uh, in, in the us in terms of the distribution reach that we would target covering uh, the major industrial centers uh, yeah. as a percentage where would we be currently uh, in terms of the uh, defined top 40 distributor served areas, if I have to make a judgment in terms of the quality of our presence, we are only at around 20%. Uh, sure. And uh, 
any target of getting to closer to the optimum level over the next couple That's of years there is, there is there is no optimal percentage since you asked a question i gave gave you a rough uh, idea but our goal is as part of our uh, ck2 aspiration as well as our strategic business plan to be strongly present in the uh, top 40 uh, of the distributor served areas right so you know it's can i give a percentage no i cannot because it's it is all a function of what the opportunity is available if I, if everything was in in my hands then i would put a percentage down but a lot of it is in, in the hands of independent distributors they don't come on board whether there is an opportunity for us to incubate joint ventures like we have done are there people willing to come on board so it's quite a few variables that are there yeah. right sure um, uh, that helps uh, thank you so much for taking my questions thank you very much as there are no further questions from the participants i would now like to hand the conference over to mr kamlesh kotak for their closing comments over to you sir yeah uh jay before that hello yeah yeah kamlesh yeah i just want to understand one broader perspective now that one year since the uh, number 2 and number 3 global giants have amalgamated yeah. how the competitive landscape has changed you see anything uh, that has changed on ground in terms of the competitive landscape from ir and garden and all i don't think there is any uh, change in the competitive landscape in a significant way across the board globally in specific markets there are opportunities for companies like us now when you have two companies that have come together both of them have a set of distributors and when they put the thing together one of the synergies that they'd like to release is to reduce their channel right Uh, right. make the channel more efficient so when that happens then there are channel partners who are looking for alternate products right so those are opportunities that come right so i would say is it there at board in all markets no there are pockets in which that happens right, right. so so other than that you know of course when two companies come together their profitability improves because there are a lot of synergies duplications that they eliminate which is what they did right mm-hmm. and right. and that's how they they've increased their profitability you know sure sure and and uh, just to update uh, how has been the new product which we launched in terms of the water well series how has been the response to that in the markets and how has been the market faring there the, mar- the market right now is uh, very dull right there's hardly yeah. any procurement of new machines it's the old machines that are continuing to drill because covid conditions uh cash with farmers there is there is a lot of condition mm-hmm. now there seems to be a bit of a the some semblance very initial stages of some green shoots now mm-hmm. so that's on the market side on our product we have run this product now for almost a year and a half right and we've had actually competitors customers who actually ran the machine uh uh in their in their drilling right and the uh, feedback has been outstanding both on performance in terms of uh efficiency cost uh of drilling as well as the reliability of the product so they, it's been a very positive uh, response so we're ready Sure. when that happens yeah sure. so it's not like it's not like lg is an unknown brand so the all customers know it and it's a very small community when something good happens the news spreads fast and something bad happens also news spreads fast so some something good has happened now and i think the news has spread well now we got to wait and see yeah sure right thanks jay for your insightful uh, discussion and thanks participants for joining for the call sure. any closing remarks sure. you want to make jay there's one area that i did not cover which i'd like to cover which i forgot is uh, our debt position uh, compared to march uh, june debt position our debt levels have gone up by uh, 10 crores uh, so from 100 odd it's happened to 110 
Now in July, we are back to less than, we are lower than March now. So it was just one of those uh, periods that we had to go through where we had to overstock on inventory because of supply challenge. Now in July, that is back. So debt levels are going to start going down again. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. So with that, we conclude the call. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Kamlesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pasipan, on behalf of Asian Market Securities. That concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.